I'm going to just hit the button. Here we go. So that Gabby can see it later. Okay. So I think we should get going. I think this is absolutely fantastic. Um, it was an amazing experience working with all six of you. I really, my, my hat is off to you. My hat is off to you. The interns this summer each created two spectacular, what we call in the consulting word, deliverables. They each did like a 70 page PowerPoint presentation on one of six different universal dishes used obviously around the world for, for repurposing leftovers. And then they had the, I think, equally amazing experience of coming up with a Pecha Kucha that attempted not just to summarize their learning, but to actually distill it into a point of view about how we can use, how what's the best way to use their dish to excite and empower home cooks and professionals to use leftovers. So you'll be, you'll, everyone is going to be listening for that unique point of view that each one found is the magical way to, to celebrate their particular dish. So there was a tremendous amount of work involved and a tremendous amount of learning. But I also want to, on the work front, is extend everybody of the interns an apology. You guys have not only been amazing, but you stuck it out until August 13th. In looking back, this, this project probably should have ended last Friday so you guys could take a break. You know what I mean? And a breather. So thank you for sticking in with me during this time. It just shows your real stick to and professionalism. So there you go. So now let's do the presentations, okay? And um, the Gabby is going to go last because she is en route from a family party to her home. So she will go last, and that's why we're going to record it for her, okay? But otherwise, what I've done is I have put the numbers one through five, Gabby will be six, in random order. So I'm not going to choose anybody to go first. You'll choose yourselves. So just everyone yell out a number between one and five, that will not necessarily be your order. It will, I will show you on the, on my random piece of paper here where your number fits in the lineup. So just Anna, give me a number, one to five. Two. That's Anna, great. Next, uh, Lauren. Uh, four. Okay, Lauren. Okay, um, Carissa. Six. Uh, oh, wait, no, five, five. Right, right. Okay, so Carissa, okay. Of the numbers that are left, Anya? Three. Three. And no one ever wants to choose one, so Ava, you get it. Are you okay with being the first? Wanted one anyway. Actually, you're one, but you're not the first. You know who's the first? Here's the list for complete transparency. Anna, number two is at the top of the list. So Anna, talk to us about soups. I will... Oh, wait. Can you make me... Can you run your own slides, Anna? Um, and share them with us, or how would that work? Oh yeah, I can share my screen. All right, can you? Let's see how that works. Okay. Okay, everybody, ready? Put on your seatbelts. Here we go. Six and a half minutes. Um, I think you have so to get six minutes and a and a thirty minute grace period. Okay. I think you just have to sh let me share my screen. And how do I do that? Um, Always the Zoom. All right, so I I can put up your presentation. There it is. But you want to run it. Do you want me yeah. to run it for you? Um, I can run it if you just. Yeah, I think if you either there should be an option to stop sharing screen or else. Can I or Anna? Sorry, you Good. should also request control from her. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Cecilia. I knew you would know, Cecilia. Okay. <laughs> I provided Zoom support for my old job. So you're, you're I know way too much. Last year, too. Okay, so, um, so now, 
uh, Anna, you share your screen. So when I click share screen, it just says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I think there's a button. Do you want I me to host you to disable? Um, yeah. Does or anyone you, know you, how to do you it? You disable me. No, am I? Anybody you now? You could make her a co-host maybe or make her the host temporarily. Okay, so let's see here. Participants. Okay, participants. Okay, Anna is now going to be the host. Okay. Change host. Okay, so everyone, that's the drill. Thank you. Okay, so Anna, now how do we? I don't see your slides. There we do. Oh, now we're in the in the in the in the mode too. We're 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 in the um the view mode. So everyone can go up into view and see everybody. Or they can just see the speaker, right? You guys all know how to do that? Okay, so Anna, when you are ready, so show us your your first slide, your title oh, yeah. slide there. Okay, and I, 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 you, you may be able to go into screen only mode or it's okay to show us the speaker oh. notes and your little thumbnails on the side. Do you know if you go into present? Yeah, I'll do present. Okay. okay, beautiful. All right, can everybody see Anna's soup presentation? Okay, everybody ready? Okay. Okay, Anna, take it away. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about soup, which is the ever evolving way to repurpose your leftovers. And so soup is an ancient and ubiquitous dish that has spread all around the world. However ancient it may be, it is still highly relevant to food cultures in the US and globally. It will likely stay relevant as more Americans discover different kinds of soup that they haven't tried yet, and the types of soup continue to adapt to changing food tastes, as well as ingredients that become available in our country in supermarkets. It likely continues to be a source of nostalgia and comfort, especially for the sick and infirm. Oh, wait. Okay, so soup has been around forever. It's thought to be first made in 20,000 BC in China based on pottery marks that pottery that was found with scorch marks on it. And now soup is an integral part of food cultures across the world. So soup is everywhere. It's in your home, it's in the grocery store, it's in your dining hall, it's in restaurants, and it's even been to space. In 1962, Mercury astronauts brought packets of mushroom soup to space as a part of their meal plan. So there's different categories of soup, one being hot soups, which you're probably very familiar with, and these are typically savory and most of the some popular ones include gumbo french onion soup pho italian minestrone and a few others another two categories of soup are thick versus thin soups thicker soups are usually thickened by cream such as new england clam chowder or creamy tomato basil soup versus the thin soups have a thinner liquid base such as consomme or miso Another type of category of soup is cold soups, and these are typically savory, such as gazpacho, borscht, or vissoise, but there are also sweet or dessert cold soups, such as sour cherry soup, or zenzai, or tong sui, which are Asian soups. So soup can be eaten at any time of the day. So for example, in Japan, miso soup is often eaten for breakfast, or before any meal to ensure enough nutrients is ingested during mealtime. And then in America, there's it's more common for a soup and sandwich combo for lunch. And multiple types of soup are served as appetizers. And also in Japan, ramen is served as a full dinner because it has meat, veggies, and carbs. So it's considered a meal in a bowl. And then um, there are a lot of dessert soups such as zenzai. So one commonality among all soup cultures is all food cultures is that soup is served to the sick. So this is because it's easy to sip, it's easy to digest, and it's packed with a lot of nutrients. Plus, it's very comforting. And um, among food cultures, every culture has its own soup etiquette and tools. So, for example, in Japan, it's considered a compliment to the chef if you slurp versus in Western cultures, it's a sign of disrespect. And in America, shallow bowls and specific types of spoons are used for different soups versus in Japan, large dark 
soup bowls are used and specific soups such as the Syrians, which you've probably used with miso soup. And soup is entrenched in American food culture. And this is because uh, there are popular commercialized brands that you probably recognize um, that each have their own branding and technology. So Progresso, for example, highlights that it's a traditional soup versus Campbell's main advertisement is that it's condensed and Lipton or highlight that they're both dry mixes. So soup is entrenched in American food culture, but also American culture in general. So for example, you guys are probably familiar with Andy Warhol's famous Campbell soup painting, which was made in 1962. And also the popular show Seinfeld, one of the main characters one of the characters in the show was known as a soup Nazi, where he was a very strict soup store owner, but the main character still attended his store because he loves soup so much. In the future, there's a lot of potential to incorporate soup into American culture even more. For example, um, if we started putting sweet soups in cans that could be sold at the grocery store, or or if sweet soups were served as the soup du jour or in soup kitchens. And soup is an excellent container for leftovers. First of all, because the broth soup is made from is comes from stock, which is actually made of food scraps. And then in general, soup is an excellent container because it's accessible, it's versatile, it's comforting, and it frees as well. So it lasts a long period. And um, it's also excellent container for leftovers because there are a lot of garbage soup recipes which incorporate leftover ingredients into soup, such as everything with the kitchen sink soup recipe. And then there's also recipes like day after Thanksgiving turkey soup, which incorporate holiday leftovers. So if I had a wish, it would be that someone would be there to make comforting soup for when I'm sick, like my mom always did. And so one idea I had was to have a store that sells homemade soup and delivers it to your door for whenever you're sick, you can order it for yourself. And then my second idea is to have a national homemade soup day where um, everyone in a community makes soup and then gives it to a few neighbors so that it's passed along. And then my third idea is to have a soup drop off at old age homes and hospitals. Thank you. That's my Terrific. soup. Terrific. Five minutes, 59 seconds. You're amazing. <laughs> Perfect. And it was so excellent. Round of applause Thank for you. Anna. Anna, does, and you can unmute everybody or do I need to unmute you? You can all unmute yourselves, right? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any questions at all for Anna or any comments or anything that you connected with? Like Lucia, did you like all the Asian soup references there and the bowls and the etiquette? Is that kind of neat? Yeah, I really like how diversified the whole concept was. Like, it's not something you can just find in one country. It's like in all cultures. That's really cool that like they use soup as leftovers. It's like a common universal method to just repurpose food. It's really cool. Stick around, Lucia. <laughs> all of these dishes are all over the world and they're all ancient. What's the one thing we learned is they're all ancient. So I'm glad you noticed that. Okay. Any other comments before we move on to the next person? Okay. I've never heard of dessert soup. That was interesting. Isn't that cool? And the idea that we could actually take dessert soup and we're going to need it under climate change, man. We got to cool off. <laughs> we got to have dessert soup for lunch, you know, and breakfast. So good, good point there. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, so next up is Carissa. So Carissa and Anna, before we, we go, just introduce yourself to everybody. Tell them like what class you're in, what your major is, where okay. you live, just a little bit of Colgate. Okay, hi, I'm Anna Donovan. I'm a rising sophomore at Colgate. And right now I'm intending on majoring in environmental studies and psychology, but I'm still unsure. I have to take a few classes. And my freshman year, I was part of the sustainability representatives program, which I loved, and I'm excited to get more involved with sustainability on campus. Fantastic. Fantastic. What dorm do you live in, Anna? I'm living in Burke next year. Okay. I don't know if anyone lived there. 
Fantastic. Okay, so next up is Carissa. If you'll start by introducing yeah. yourself, Carissa. Hi, I'm Carissa. I'm a second semester sophomore at Colgate. I took a gap semester, so my years are really off. I'm a bio major, not declared yet, but I intend to declare next semester. And I'm moving into Colgate in like five hours. So I'll be there soon. Um, and then I'm gonna have to go, wait, number one, can you tell me who my audio is? I'm at a Starbucks right now. And there's a lot of background noise that I hear. Is it all right on your end? I, we can, I can hear the background noise, but it's not intrusive. Okay, cool. It's okay. We can hear you fine if you want to speak up a little bit. If you can in the Starbucks, okay. that would be great. I'm okay. soft spoken anyway. Everyone knows that. I know you are. Okay. Um, so, wait, can we see your presentation? Do we have to make you the host? Yes. Okay. How do I make you the host? How do I make Carissa the co host? Reclaim host. How do I make Carissa the host? Somebody tell oh, me. Oh, I think I have to do it. Oh, you can do it now? Um, let me see. I have it right now as, oh, it says only okay, host. Reclaim today. host. Okay, so, all right, I can, I just reclaimed myself as a host. Carissa, you're now the host. Change okay, host. I think I can um, share my screen. Yeah, okay, good work, good work. Okay, okay. beautiful, Carissa. Okay. Let us know when you wanna start. Okay, um, so tarts, they're the new moment for leftovers, but there's a surprise twist. I won't just be talking about tarts. I'll also be talking about savory pies because savory pies are kind of the original savory tart and savory tarts are a category within savory pies. So savory pies and savory tarts, they both have a long history, but right now in American culture, savory pies are descendant and savory, savory tarts are having a cultural moment. So on the screen is a vintage housewife holding a baked pie because savory pies have a long association with house with housewives and American nostalgia. But savory tarts are kind of known as these beautiful, aesthetic, delicious, vegetable-filled dishes. Um, so savory pies, as I mentioned before, have a really long history that go back into ancient times, starting in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. And so in ancient Greece, they used to have these like placenta cakes and then um, they stayed and they remained throughout history. And then they became really popular and had a huge moment in medieval Europe. And they're kind of the hot thing that everyone had. The British elite were all eating savory pies. They loved them, um, these things called pigeon pies. And so they're very ceremonial. And what they would do is they would put like live pigeons into the pies at a wedding or something like that. And then when they would cut into it, all these pigeons would just like fly out and surprise everybody. But um. Pigeon pies, because they were so popular among the British elite, they came and they became a big thing among the British masses. And then they spread all, all over the rest of Europe, big thing in France, big thing in Italy, big thing basically everywhere. And then because Europe was such a global superpower, it kind of spread around the world through things like colonialism, global trading, all of that. And then um, they're a big part of a lot of holidays in both UK culture and other European cultures. One of the big holidays up there and that's featured on this slide is Eastern Orthodox Easter. And that's a Greek holiday. And so people would make savory pies. It's this week long um, religious holiday. And then you make savory pies and then you share them with your family essentially at the end of the fasting period. So savory pies have a long tradition of kind of bringing people together um, celebrations, things like that. And then, um, as I was saying before, savory pies spread around the world along with savory tarts. And so these are some examples of that in Latin America, um, in Australia. Savory pies and savory tarts are huge in Australia. For some reason, they love them. It's kind of a cultural food there. And so Aussie meat pies are very big there. And then in the Middle East as well. This isn't reflective of savory pies throughout the world. It's a really small sample size, but it just goes to show how diverse and how many different textures and how many different ways that they can be prepared. Um, and then this is more specific to the UK, which is kind of like the main spot of savory pies and tarts. And then it goes, it transition, transitions into the US. So some main forms of savory pies and savory tarts in the US are pizza, chicken pot pies, shepherd's pies, 
And something that all these dishes have in common is just American nostalgia. They're all comfort foods. You eat them with your family. It's a good time. Um, so this is more about the history of savory pies in the US. They're really big in colonial America because savory pies are really great for preserving food. So people would quit food in them to preserve them for a long time, which was essential in colonial America because there was no refrigeration. And then as savory pies progressed in the US, we, we in the US, we like things a little bit sweeter. And so we like our pies and tarts sweeter too. So now things like cherry pies and apple pies are quintessential American dishes. Um, and so that's kind of how they show up in the US. But savory pies are no longer kind of a thing. Now we love savory tarts. Savory tarts are having a huge moment. And these are some examples of it. Um, Julie Jones is actually a British chef, not an American chef, but she became famous because she makes these beautiful looking um, pastry tarts. And she spends a lot of time like rearranging flowers and vegetables to just make the most beautiful tarts as possible. And tarts themselves are kind of a French dish. They, um, they come from, the, from this little story of these two girls in Normandy, and one of them was making a tart or making a pie and she messed up while making the pie and put it in upside down. And then she served it and it became a hit and then it spread all over France. And because the French are trendsetters, it spread all over the rest of the world. And then one of the most popular versions of a savory pie is a quiche. And quiches are everywhere too. They are an egg-based egg <laughs> tart with um, cheese and meat. And then these are some examples of leftovers, of how things have been repurposed into leftover pies and tarts. This is a leftover green seeds and cheese tart. And this is a leftover um, Thanksgiving pie. And pies still have a strong relationship in the US today with holidays. And so a lot of the leftover examples you'll find are like closely associated with Thanksgiving, especially because pies are such a Thanksgiving dish, like pumpkin pie and pecan pie, things like that. And then this is a kitchen sink quiche, which is another great way to repurpose leftover vegetables and cheeses into a quiche or a tart. And then um, this is another example of how savory tarts and pies are having a big moment. In LA, there's this huge restaurant that was made by a Michelin starred chef, Curtis Stone. He's actually, he's Australian. So that goes to show how big like savory pies and tarts are in Australia and how that's affecting the US. And so they have this, um, this shop that only sells pies called Pyron by Gwen and it's amazing. I haven't been, but I'm gonna check it out, I guess. And then um, there's this concept that's been spreading around lately where it's a pie party and people just bring pies and you share them and you bring them together with your friends and you eat them. And I guess that's my wish for the future with savory pies and tarts where people just come together as a collective and enjoy and celebrate. Um, so that's the end. Thank you. Terrific. Good job. Good job. You did great. Great, Carissa. Okay, any questions or clarification or comments about the, anything that was said or anything your own experience about pies or tarts? Any of you into a tart moment now? Anybody got a pie nostalgia story? No? Oh. Okay, you did great, Carissa. Okay, next up is Ava. All right, so let's, I'm going to reclaim the host thing. Uh-oh, this is telling me the meeting's going to end in 10 minutes. Shall I ignore it or should we all jump back on and when, I, when, we, when it runs out? We've done that in the past. We'll all jump back on when it gets closer. All right, let's go through Ava. Um, I don't want to rush you, Ava. Okay, I'm gonna, how do I reclaim you, Ava? Uh, reclaim host, and then I'm gonna make Ava the host. Okay, change host. Okay, Ava. All right, you're on, Ava. Ava might have had the most challenging one. You'll see why. Okay, let me know when you're ready to go, Ava. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can, perfectly. Okay. Um, curry. With a little more promotion, it can become a great way to repurpose leftovers in the United States. Sorry, I can't see my, um, my speaker notes. I'm just trying to figure out how to do that. 
and you can show us the speaker notes. You can leave it in that mode if you want. Okay. Don't go crazy. Great. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Okay. You can start again if you want. Having issues. I don't know. Does how did other people do it? That's how fine. I... Just show us that. Okay. It's good, Ava. Let's go because we're going to run out of time on the. Right, 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 right. And then if we all run out of time, everybody jump right back on. Okay. All right, everybody, just jump back onto the link. Okay, okay Ava. Anytime you're ready. Okay. Um, curry is a really delicious dish with a really rich history and not surprisingly, it is spread around the world. However, it has an identity crisis. Americans don't know what it really is. So if we want to make it a great way for Americans to repurpose their leftovers, like it is in other countries, um, like with the UK, we need to make it easier, cooler, and show people how it aligns with today's taste and lifestyles. Curry is a dish as well as a spice blend, which can be confusing. Curry has many kinds of dishes with different names like tikka masala, which is on the left, but all seasoned with curry the spice blend, which is on the right. Um, curry the spice blend has three basic spices, ginger, garlic, and turmeric, which have all been found in ancient pots. So that's how we know what they originally were. And others have been added over time as it's adapted to taste, it, taste around the world. Curry the spice blend of spices originated in India and it dates back to 2600 BC. In the 18th century, Britain imported curry spices from India who then sold it to other parts of Europe. And on the left, you can see it's the map of the spice trade. So this is how the spices originally started spreading. And on the right is a store in the UK. There's different types of curries that exist around the world. Here's a sampling from Northern and Southern India, Bangladesh, Bengal, China, Japan, Thailand, Trinidad and Tobago, and Jamaica. As you can see, the curries consist of meat, fish, vegetables, or lentils cooked in a stew-like curry sauce. And this is made from a number of different bases. So it can be yogurt, coconut milk, regular milk, or water. And it's all flavored with curry, the spice blend even though those spices vary depending on where you are as well. Curry is very ingrained in UK food culture. Um, chicken tikka masala is the national dish of the UK. They have a national curry week. There's curry houses all over the country and a lot of them are opened by Bangladeshi immigrants after World War II. Curries are also actively promoted within the country by celebrities, chefs, TV shows. They're on social media as well. Um, but although there are curries that are consumed in the US, generally speaking, curry is not very popular in the United States. And there's a couple of challenges, like it's confusing. We don't really know if it's a dish or a spice or a spice blend. It's not quick or easy to make. It's not seen as particularly healthy most of the times and it's perceived as foreign and spicy, which Americans tend to stay away from. So it's like a misconception as well. However, there are opportunities to make it more popular in the United States. So we have celebrities like Matt Damon and Lady Gaga who talk about how they love curry. And it can be healthy, it can be light, it can be made with yogurt, it can be made with coconut milk, which are both on the rise and popular. And curry the spice blend and prepared sauces are both available in stores already. In order to overcome these challenges and use our opportunities, we need to clear up the confusion, first of all. So we need to explain what curry is to people. We need to take advantage of opportunities and promote it with celebrity chefs and make it seem like an everyday meal and show normal Americans eating it. And we need to make it easier. So that can be through recipes and other strategies. And then we also need to promote the lighter and healthier recipes that are in step with today's eating trends. Many recipes exist that can help excite people to make curries as a perfect container for leftovers. So it's the perfect dish for leftovers because it's versatile. You can use whatever you have on hand, whatever's in the fridge. It's easy to make with the use of commercially available and very accessible curry powder and the curry sauces in the stores. And curry makes great leftover itself. So the bottom two images are things you can make from leftover curry. So kind of like the opposite, but still you can make curry puffs and you can make a curry omelet. And there's recipes that exist to make these delicious foods that are also in step with current American food trends. So the first one is a vegan curry made from mixed vegetables. These are all leftover dishes. And then the next one is coconut curried mixed vegetables. So those were leftover vegetables as well. And then the last one is 
chicken curry. And there's another section on that website that shows how you can make gluten-free chicken curry with your leftovers as well. My wish for the future would be to figure out how to make curry more popular in the US so that we can use it more in our leftovers. And I have three ideas. My first idea would be to make pre-made pre-packaged sauce more readily available. So this is curry in a hurry helper. So it was once hamburger helper. So it's people are still making it, but it's like halfway there. Um, the next one would be to have more food trucks, kind of like we have at Colgate or rig truck, but have that be uh, more widely accessible, have curry in food courts, curry in restaurants that cater to young on the go lifestyles. So that could be like sweet green or cava or chipotle, but have it for curry. And then my third idea would be to have more YouTube channels, popular YouTube channels or popular celebrities um, or popular chefs talking about how to make authentic curry in a hurry. The end. Read the rest of that. Is it the end or just the beginning of curry in the US? <laughs> Good job. Good job. Good job. Can you see how that was really challenging? Because she had kind of this crazy dish that people don't understand. It took us all summer to understand it ourselves. So you did great. Great, 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 Ava. And, great, and Ava had the entire month of July where she was out of commission at a camp. So she did all of this work, June. And then the last couple of weeks, you really, you did great, Ava. Okay, any questions for Ava or comments about curry? Okay, we have one minute and 54 seconds to go. So I would say let's go back on. And then when we come back, we'll do the next three and Anya will be up. So we're going to hang up and then get right back on. Okay, leave the meeting and we'll come back. Great, okay. Assign a new host. No. <laughs>